we <coughs> we're extremely pleased for those of you that are joining yes. us this evening. Is it? Yes, sir. Thank you. For our regular, for our, we got a couple of new members that we'll uh, introduce real quickly in one second. But for those that uh, for those that uh, that are part of this group, part of this organization for the last year and a half or so, uh, we have met since October. I think mean, we the calendar didn't work out for November and December. I apologize for that. But it's been a, been a couple of months since we've been together. So in that in that time frame, we we got an opportunity to. Uh, to invite and engage, uh, to engage some, some, some folks in our community that are extremely uh, vested, not only in our school district, but in our community. And so I'm going to ask a couple of the previous members of our group to introduce themselves. Uh, just a little bit, not much to do, just a little bit about what your involvement today is. So if you're a parent, if you're a parent of a child, if you're, whatever your role is and how anybody has an impact on you. And I think we'll start with Ani. Uh, you don't mind? Ani, yes. Ani. You don't have to stand yeah. up. We're not here. <laughs> no. um, uh, my name is Ani Galusian. I have two children with the Pentone Quest Elementary. Uh, so I'm a parent. Uh, but I'm also, um, in my spot, as I'm a physics consultant for change and transformation. And I work in oil and gas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. King, how are you, ma'am? Good. How are you? We're doing great. Good.
think it will be built up. Two new ones are going to, uh, they're going to be uh, received. And, you know, the dynamics keep the nature of what we put a team together. So, uh, I think it's very successful. I think it's a good this team building workshop. It was, it was pretty good. So, anyway, other than that, we're blowing and going in the school district right now. We're in the second semester of the, of the school year. And uh, we, uh, we had a couple of pieces of information. Uh, we're, uh, our budget, and we'll cover our budget tonight, but from a financial perspective, we are uh, financially healthier than we thought we were going to be in August. A lot of reasons for that. The revenue has increased enrollment. We have more kids in our school district than we, were, than we projected, which is a good thing. Uh, so a lot of things are a lot of things are happening that, that gives us uh, gives us uh, opportunities to be, uh, to be hopeful for the future, but also be proud of what we're doing. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you, and I'm going to get to the points tonight, and I found this interesting. Last week in the Chronicle, the Chronicle did all of them. Uh, on, and I forget how they titled it, but they did they, they, they wrote an article on some of the more, uh, what they forecasted to be the hot spot areas for residential growth and improvements. And the number one area in the Great Eastern area was the Heights. And the number two area was the Avian area. And I've shared that with some people, and those people who have been around this community for a long time, so they can't remember the last time that this general, that this community was listed in any type of, any type of ranking, if you will, uh, or something like that. So with a lot of the things that the business community is seeing, what they is seeing with West Chase and, and what they're hearing and kind of forecasting on the business side and, and what we're beginning to see on the residential side, uh, one of the things that we've been pushing for for a long time is to, to you know, transform the, the quality of life, if you will, the, the residential opportunities for people in this community. And so maybe that's the key to take hold. And in the school district will do everything we can do to support that and promote that. All right. Anything else that I've not had a little bit of fun about the season? John, do you have any words with us? No. All right. All right. We've got two topics that we want to cover tonight. That, uh, and one of them we have not talked to you about. This is, this is not one of the things y'all asked to, to hear about. But, uh, next week we're going to be talking to the board about it. I want to introduce Natalie Martinez. For those of you that were in the original group, I think Natalie spoke to the first group. If I'm not mistaken, uh, a year and a half ago on, on uh, student testing, student assessment, accountability, the things that the state of Texas and the federal government looks at as they're really determining how does the school district do it and how does the how they do it. Tonight, I've asked her to come in and visit with you and get some, some feedback from you. And I really want some feedback to the extent that you're able to provide it on, a, on an issue that House Bill 5 included. Those of you that are familiar with House Bill 5, part of House Bill 5 that we fought for, that we argued for, was a way in which campuses and school districts could communicate with their communities, their parents, their, their, their community, about how that campus was doing and how that district was doing, above and in addition to just the single test scores that are typically used right now. As you know, the Chronicle and the media, they, they typically they report how the campus is doing. They're basically just telling you how, how the kids do the test. That's all there is to do. Right. Kids do well on the test, and you're sure they do well. If you do poorly on the test, you sure the school will do poorly. You and I both know that people who are open minded, the reasonable minded people know that there's a lot more to a successful school to a successful district than just test scores. But how school five is a component of it is called the inner student community engagement. And now he's going to talk to you about that. And so think of it this way. The law requires certain things under this community engagement piece. So whenever those test scores, think of it this way, whenever those test scores come out and the Chronicle reports them and we send them out, think about another measure which is also going to be put up there that says, okay, here's how we get test score wise, here are the things that are important to the community. Here are things that we are interested in. Here are things that seven member school board are interested in uh, as it relates to the fine arts, as it relates to the 21st century workforce development. And she'll talk to you about those nine, those, those nine areas. So I'm, what I'm trying to do is we're trying to build a, a, a document, a simple to read 
document that is more comprehensive about how a school or how a business is doing than just test scores. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. She's going to talk you through that, and hopefully this is going to be fairly interactive, asking for your opinions and what your thoughts are. Because quite frankly, along with the seven member school board, you represent the community, you represent certain parts of the community, so you're speaking for a large number of people. Uh, so what are the things that would help you understand what your campus is for All right? With that, I'm going to Okay, thank you. So the great thing about this is that it is still in draft mode, which means we need your input to start changing things and making sure that we are meeting the needs of how we get this um, scorecard out to the community and what do we want to measure. Um, I want you to keep in mind that the state has given us very little guidance on this. They told us what nine indicators to look at, and that's about it. After that, we define what we want to measure. We define what the standards are locally. So if you can imagine, every district will have something different, right? Every district will measure, within fine arts, they will measure something different. They will have different standards. And so immediately, these scorecards will look different across the state, but that's okay. We have um, started collaboration with many school districts around the Houston area. We have another meeting on Thursday with the, uh, in Sapphire ISD, which will include Klein and Katie and uh, and Unmull, and um, we've also talked with Fort Bend. I've been down to Austin to, to meet with uh, Tassa and some, some groups down there. And every time we have a meeting, it's similar to this. We kind of share what we're doing and what we think it should look like, and we get more thoughts and ideas. And then we go back to the drawing board and we start changing things up again. So it has come a long way, but we know we're not there yet. We still want some changes. You'll see documents that are incomplete because we don't quite have all the data ready for that but I want to share with you kind of where we're headed, okay? Now, when we meet with other districts, we are very aware that we are not going to have the same reporting piece. We get that. But we do want to have the same purpose and the same message. The real purpose of this is just to help community understand all of the things that we are doing in our schools outside of that assessment piece. We want community to have a big picture of what we do in our schools and what we provide our students so they can have more opportunities to in and join us in the, the wonderful things with their kiddos. So it's more of an educational piece as well, but then we also have to rate ourselves. So if you remember in the old days, we used to get the exemplary recognized, remember those pieces? State law says we have to rate ourselves that way, so we will. However, they don't tell us exactly how we have to put that out there to the public. So you'll see how we, we've kind of addressed that issue. Let me just flip that down. Natalie, what's, what's the official title for this? We don't have one yet, so that's a great question. <laughs> you said, what's the official title? Well, um, community and student engagement is the big piece that, that, that that's how it's addressed in the law. Um, we started calling it the scorecard, but then we realized that that really wasn't what we wanted to do. That automatically says rating and score. Mm -hmm. And so right now, I'm on, um, I've heard call, it called the voice or our voice, we've heard it called our stories. Um, we are open to suggestions on that, so as you listen to this presentation, be jotting down your thoughts if you come up with a quick title with that as well. Um, as we meet with different groups, we're just taking down ideas and we'll go back to the committee to address that as well. So we don't actually have a title for ours yet. <clears throat> so if you can imagine you are on a web page, and that's what you're looking at here, all right? Um, you'll see our, our voice at the very top. You'll see right now it's just standard clip art pictures, but these, of course, would be aided kids once we are completed with it. Um, in the very middle, you will also see a video. And as Mr. Chambers said, there are nine components that we must address. This video will encompass all nine pieces, hopefully in ten minutes or less, right? We wanted to make sure that there was a quick visual so if someone was sitting down and they didn't want to read through pages and pages of information, they wanted to see it in action, 
and we can hit play and let them watch that video. Um, we are currently working on that video. We have a couple of pieces that are already complete, probably about halfway done with that piece. But our camera crews are going out to schools and making sure that we have great videos of all of our kids in action, so that's being put into place right now. Underneath that, you'll see a narrative that's not the actual narrative. This is really just a template to help people understand where we're headed. But we'll have somebody write up a little piece about Ailey's and the things that have happened in the current school year. And we'll have that piece there. And then underneath that, you'll see what we envision as what we're calling now the scorecard. You'll see the nine pieces on the left-hand side. And although they're blocked out right now, you'll see them coming up. Um, and then on the right-hand side, you see the color blocks. That is kind of our way of giving a rating without putting those titles out there, right? The titles will be shown a little bit later, but if you can imagine to the far right, that kind of fuchsia color, that's your exemplary. In the green is your recognized. The blue would be your acceptable, and where we don't have anything right now, that would be your unacceptable piece. It's almost like a sliding scale, right? Because you're on the web, you can imagine if I were to click uh, Fine Arts is one of them. If I were to click Fine Arts, it would take you to page two, which would give you more in depth about Fine Arts and how we are rating each particular piece. Okay. So let me stop right there and get your thoughts and opinions just on page one, the big picture of the AE scorecard. And let me hear your thoughts or suggestions. So is there going to be several? I mean, so will there be one for eight as a whole, and then there'll be an individual one? Or there'll be 41 for each school. Mm -hmm. Every school will have their own one. Well. And are all of those accessible via the AD main site, or would you have to go to each um, The way we envision it, and we're working with um, another company on that, the way we envision it, um, and the way they showed it was, you would always have like a drop down here, and if I chose Alexander, then the page would change to Alexander's scorecard. So would you think about having maybe like an app where it would be convenient for someone instead of having to go straight on the website? If I want to go and look on my phone and see, compare Ailey schools, could I go on an app and is be able to? Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Are we looking at taking technology that far? Because I think more parents um, our age are at App savvy, where we want to be able to look at a scorecard and say, hey, you know what? This school meets, meets my child's needs maybe better than this necessary school does. Okay. I don't really we haven't gone that far yet. So I really don't know. In terms of making an app versus being a scorecard, it's kind of like having a scorecard versus being a scorecard. I guess, yeah, going along the same lines, if, you, if you're trying to go real-time, are you going to have a response mechanism? <clears throat> like for parents who may not understand or may have just a given question, a way they can give feedback or just ask anything. Okay. And then it's just not an app to make it compatible to view on mobile devices. Okay. Good. Yes. The um, <clears throat> periodically we get, I guess it's just a communicator. There may be some things that you can kind of uh, pick and choose out of those for the last six months to be able to say these would be good wording and for these particular items. Thank you. 
important too to have a section of how you got there. If you're exemplary and I'm recognized, I would like to know how do I get to that next level. So it'd be important for me to know what I need to do specifically or what you did specifically that got you to that point. Perfect. Okay. So I don't know how you would incorporate To build in the standards almost. Right. Mm -hmm. Just to tell me what you did different. Sure. Can I ask what you said? I just think that Maybe in general, what I'd like to see a -Leaf work on is some kind of best practices where all the teachers can go to so there's some continuity on best practices throughout the school. So maybe it's how to get to uh, having a really great art program versus how to make a behavior contract or different types of behavior contracts, <coughs> things of that nature. So maybe this could somehow incorporate that where you guys have a document repository of best practices from them.
So imagine that you clicked from page one, you clicked on the fine arts, and then you turn the page and you are on uh, the Medicare website. This, this part will be completely about fine arts. Again, that's the part that you'll see A Kids in Action. If you will have a narrative, um, if it's the A Week report card, you'll see a narrative from our, our coordinator of fine arts, and she will write that up for us. And then you will see the more specifics. So if you were asking about how do I get to the next level, this is almost getting there, not quite. But this tells you what, what do we rate you on? What are the pieces that I looked at in order to give you those ratings? But you'll see the same piece there with the color zones. And underneath that, you'll see the unacceptable, acceptable, recognized, exemplary legends, right? So that you know um, what those colors actually mean. So that's where we're sticking with the law that we do have to, to label these. But on the top, it'll just be the color. Um, and you can see wellness and physical education would be next, but, but you won't turn the page to see that. It'll be temp the template will be similar to this because each coordinator is working on their pictures and working on their narratives right now for me. Okay. And you'll also notice that um, there are three that say campus chosen performance measure. We decided that we would allow campuses to choose three of their own measures so that they could individualize their scorecard for themselves. Right? So when we set it up centrally, I limited each team to only five. And we decided to try to keep it as simple as possible, year one, because we didn't really know what we were getting into. Limited them to five. You'll see some of them in just a minute only have three, which is quite all right as well. But we wanted to give campuses the opportunity as well to, to, to shine. Um, so for our home quest who has dual language, we want them to be able to add a measure. For early college, you may have something different. We want them to be able to add a measure. So you'll see campus-specific pieces there. They will rate themselves. They will collect their data as well. Um, and we'll have monitoring pieces for that as well, just to individualize for the schools. Okay. Comments on that piece? If a parent clicks on a different campus, let's say, and they have a program that the parent finds um, really amazing, is there some way that's built in where the parent could like leave a comment that would go directly to the right person within their school or some way for us to communicate again to just build better continuity within the district right? Um, so that they have people talking to one kind another? Of, kind of like the response piece that somebody else has said. When we met with this company at uh, K-12 Insight, they actually suggested building in that piece. Um, we haven't quite gotten to the specifics of where that email would go, right? Because I think in their mind it would all come to me, which is great. I can forward things on. Um, but yes, it has been in discussion to where it's more interactive. Of, I have a question. Let me know more about this kind of piece. So, right. so yes, I'll keep writing that one down. Okay. It keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
couple of them in, and they're not, they're not too lengthy. So, are you thinking we were And the, the reason I ask is if you think about it, like most of us are multitasking and we're looking at things quickly. Right. So, if you could, the more you can communicate through pictures and words, the better, because really, are they really going to sit there and take the time to read a paragraph of a narrative about, you know, if you have a picture, you have to the explanation of what's going on, and that picture can communicate the same thing as a, as a narrative. Just uh, statistically, actually looked into that when we were building some stuff for a client. It's 15 seconds that you have um, to okay. engage somebody, so you don't have a very long time. Mm -hmm. Just happened to know that random. <laughs> 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 well, when you read an email, you're looking at like three sentences, right? Yes, so <laughs> <laughs> not talked about comparison too um, it may be nice to have a box where you can check things that you like kind of like when you go to Best Buy and you compare this camera to that camera and then at the end you look and see which one has the most check marks you might oh, want to be able to com you. compare schools like Thank that too that, yes. yeah okay um, I think uh, Mr. Chambers said there's something like that already were you saying that but that something like that exists already on the home site where you can click, what, you can kind of see where you want to, you know, what district you, or what campus you want to move to. Uh, what, what I would say, there's a, the link I refer to is simple kind of, if, okay. if I'm considering getting by a state or something, and you should consider, oh, okay, okay. it wasn't, you, know, you can create your own, but we don't have that. Right. Y'all are very techy. Good <laughs> 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 Very good with the noise, how are they it was the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right, can we move on to this page here? So you, you have a, a thicker handout. This again is a draft. Um, it honestly does change from week to week. So every time we have meetings and we gather more data, we, we do make changes and updates to this. So I know that when it comes out in final form, the standards may be different, the measures may be different, um, but this is where we are at this point in time. What you'll notice um, is that there are nine pages here to represent the nine different areas um, that we do have to address for, for Hustle 5. So you'll see fine arts wellness, you'll see dropout prevention, ESL and GT. Uh, you will also see family engagement, digital learning, 21st century classrooms, and then our compliance piece as well. If you take a look at Fine Arts, just want to walk you through how to look at it. On the Fine Arts page, you'll see that there are five performance measures, beginning with enrollment of students in Fine Arts courses. So this one is certainly geared um, towards the higher level for our high school students. They wanted to know how many students or what percentage of students were enrolling in these courses and how could they increase that number as well. So we've taken last year's data and tried to get a baseline of where we are. We're working through the process of that because, um, if you can imagine, fine arts doesn't typically look at data the same way accountability looks at data. So it was a bridge to cross over to try to help them look at that data. Um, I was pulling data for them, not knowing what everything fine arts was. I didn't realize that speech and debate was fine arts. They have 8,000 courses for fine arts. So I would check a button, and they would say, that's not ours, that goes to someone else. And then I wouldn't check it, and they would check it. So, um, we're working through that, so the standards might change. But you can see unacceptable all the way to exemplary on how a campus would be rated, right, based on their data for this current year. Um, you'll also see number one and three really should go together, so jump down to number three. Number of high school students continuing in fine arts beyond the graduation requirement. So they want to know how many kids are taking art two or music two or continuing on past just the baseline requirements. So we're looking at that as well. 
Jumping back up to number two, find our QIL competition and participation. That's a tough one to collect data on because we were relying on the campuses and the UIL people just to kind of help us gather that data. So we're working on that and trying to get that piece together as well. Uh, performance opportunities. So we are now looking at all levels for those opportunities. We want to make sure that campuses are, are encouraging our kids to perform and have those opportunities. Um, and then we're also in number five, um, hoping that they have those opportunities for more cultural development, having speakers and having field trips and those types of things. So for each of those measures, you'll see unacceptable all the way to numbers. We would collect data from the campuses. Some of these measures we can collect centrally. Some of them we are going to rely on the campus to provide us. We would then go in and rate them based on these measures. Okay. Questions on that process? Can I ask specifically about fine arts? Sure. Is there um, availability for most of the campuses to reach exemplary for, uh, like, for number one, for instance, enrollment of students in fine art courses? Um, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I do remember a range, right? So there, there was a range that we want to kind of tighten up more towards the higher end. Right. Um, so I don't have the numbers in my head. Okay, and then another question. you can question. certainly email me and I can tell you where we are. Okay, and then another question for UIL, the, like for orchestra specifically, don't they all go? Don't they all compete? I don't know they that don't? Answer. Okay. Oh, uh, UIL, UIL or UIL, don't all the students complete for, uh, compete? Like uh, orchestra or symphony students, don't they all go to UIL? No, they have to try. No. They all have to try. Yeah. They can compete in our district
to just have a link that we did this on this date, and maybe even if, let's say you had kids whose artwork went to the rodeo uh, and won first place, you can say we, we uh, are exemplary because we've won like five awards or something, you know, uh, kind of have like a kudos page or something like that to say the things that you guys did. that uh, you have over 1,000 school districts in Texas, uh, how do the state uh, ensure objectivity? Uh, how do they really become fully convinced that each district is doing this in a, a very objective way? Because if you have nothing, we're not starting with it. That might be in year three, 
right? And let's develop a system to collect data for us first. Um, so we kind of limited what we would put in this document so that it wasn't as time consuming as it was right now. It is very time consuming right now. However, if you're one and learning. Um, but we also are working with Cape Health Insight, who I think is going to be very helpful in this piece as well in the development of it. So all of these tricky things are kind of outside us and helping us with that piece. Um, but bigger picture too, we want to educate community on how to be more engaged with our schools right. and help them support us with, with growing our children. And I think that's kind of the bigger picture of educate them on how to come in, educate them on when we do things and where we do things and what are your opportunities to come in and help us. Um, so that's kind of bigger picture where I think it's going. Mm -hmm. And I think that leads to student success. Mm -hmm. Well, because you have more well, and more communication. <laughs> Yes, we're good, thanks. responsible for it. It's actually been divided by departments centrally. Um, because most of those things happen centrally, we do we do part of that information for the campus, right? So it, for example, came from the federal funds coordinator but a director, but I got a piece that was just accountability, so I have to make sure that you know the performance reports are on the web. So I'll be checking that. I need to make sure that SECs are running I'm going to check for that. So centrally we'll go in and check it and it'll all funnel back to the federal funds director who will then analyze that data and help us report out. Okay, so each school is responsible for filling this out and this goes to the district who compiles all that information and then from there you go to and report that to the... For most of the indicators, yes, but for compliance, most of those things are, are done here in this office. Okay. Are our campuses filling it out on the web somewhere? Or are they actually having to physically read it and circle all five million things? We're not there yet. So for compliance, Central will fill it out. For wellness, campuses will fill that out. Um, right now, I have it on the spreadsheet. I have it ready to go. But I'm, we're, we're hoping for a different way to do that. And we're hoping that they can click buttons and it automatically feeds the ratings. It's not going to be enough to figure that out. Yes. I have sort of a, a backdoor comment to this. Uh, several times we, I've heard people say that, you know, when parents go to the website to find out more about the program 
And I feel like if you, if you really want to get parents involved in the program, then you should get the kids aware of the program because once the kids get involved, their parents are going to follow whatever it is that they want them to do. So I think a good idea would be to, because everybody doesn't live around the stadium or around the school, send a bus maybe on the weekend for a workshop to go get the kids and bring them to a football game or bring them to an orchestra con uh, concert or bring them a school-related orchestra concert or art session um, within within a leaf and get them involved that way and you'll be surprised on how many doors and parents parents won't even have to see your website the kids want to get in it they're into it and a lot of kids don't know what they don't know um, some of our areas are impoverished so they're not they have a single parent and their parents are not going to be able to bring them to the football game or the baseball game or whatever else we have going on so if we take more initiative to to get our kids that we already have involved I think we'll see a higher turnaround and a, a great achievement for them in the fine arts and other areas we ship them to school but we don't ship them to anything else One thing about fine arts, they do something like that music and as far as Right. Or do a neighbor. I was thinking neighborhood play like at um, Clinton Park. They have an outdoor theater. You know, take the kids there and make them perform outdoors in the theater. There's hundreds, thousands of kids out there on the weekend. So if you go and do that, you know, some of those kids never even thought about being in theater, but they were out, happened to be out at the park. And they saw that, and now they're involved, and they're already in A-Leaf. That's the wonderful thing about it. They're already A-Leaf kids. Okay. Right. In the amphitheater area, you guys are going to develop that? Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. And I spoke with the, um, the director of the, the park, and um, so we'll have, um, like, the Miller Alpha Theater for the show. Right. Yes. That's what I was thinking. Okay. Can I play devil's advocate for what he said? I have a child with special needs who won't tell me anything. So we really need both things. I mean, I hear oh, yeah, I'm not saying do away with, other, with, yeah, with one of And I do, I really think that's great, but being a parent with a child with special needs, I need to have this kind of information. And I'm also a taxpayer and a homeowner, and I actually can't wait to see something like this that I can go into and really delve into the school and find out exactly what's available. And even being close to the administration at my school, whom I probably speak to on a, every other day, um, I still don't know everything that's available because there's so much available, right? So this will be nice. So what I would suggest is um, I'll leave these documents with you so you can look through them and see where we are with those pieces. Craig will email you shortly to follow my information. My name is Natalie Martinez again. Um, feel free to call me. We can talk about it on the phone or you can shoot me an email. Either way is great. If you have thoughts or suggestions on the documents or if you have a catchy name that would be
we wanted to build something and create something that would allow us to tell the rest of the story. And so it's going to be up to us to tell the rest of the story in the correct way and make the necessary changes to see that we go through it. And I will assure you, anybody that's speaking now, they want things to different. Or in some cases, it's miles ahead of the rest of the state. And there are other districts who are trying to just play catch and keep up with us by calling very good after the work that she's doing all the time. But uh, very, very proud of her first one and her role in all of this. And as a community member, as a parent, just know we're trying to do the best we can to tell you how we're doing. All right. The board will be taking this up. The board has a lot of decisions. They're going to be having this conversation with the new home building makers and some, some decisions ultimately as to how we can actually get to the house. All right? Thank you, Matt. Thanks. You ready? We're going to move to a totally different subject. <laughs> One of the things we talked to the board about last year, last year, a year ago, was. Uh,
take a look first, kind of like the Texas level, since we just came out of the census a few years ago, and just did what's called a community survey after the census to kind of show what's happened in the last three years, and then hone down to where we're making a boundary change and the, the effects at the very end of what we take into consideration. So hopefully it won't take as long as it just sounded like <laughs> Don't fall asleep. Uh, these slides I, I took from a, the state demographer, uh, just some subtle facts. And I've got the printed handouts, we can email this out to you. But uh, after the 2010 census, Texas was 15.7% of the change for the nation in growth of population for the last decade. Uh, when you look at how much of Texas's growth between 2000 2010, which 2009 was this particular table, how much of it was due to growth of the people living here and how much, how much of it was due to migration, okay, people that didn't start here but moved in. Almost half of our growth is due to migration, so we're a moving population. Haley has always had a very migratory population, meaning that from not even within the school year, I mean, not in the bounds of the school year, but even during the school year, moving based on when leases expire, when uh, uh, jobs change and locations. So uh, the loyalty to an area sometimes isn't tied to how great the school is. It's more based on economics at home. And, the, and that's the, the true decision. So that, just for clarification, the migration is people living in Texas from other states. People who are migrating yes. in our country. Go, go back to the previous slide before I was told. What, if you notice the percent change from 2000 to 2010, the percent change in Texas doubles the percent change in California. And a lot of that is attributed to the, the economy in California being worse than the national economy. Many of, many of you may know people that moved into the eastern area of California, uh, sold their house, and the market was fairly high, had enough cash to come down here and buy a house. The, the Texas market rates, and, well, it took off a year and to work, lived off the proceeds from that, from that home that they, that they sold in California. But that's beginning to come back and bite California bad, that, that, the, the migration out of California. And the majority of the states that they're migrating to are Texas. Uh, the percent change uh, depicted in a county map for, for the same uh, decade. You know, if you look on the Houston area, here's Harris County. This, the, the big change here that we've seen is, is in Fort Bend. And, uh, and when you see the total population, there's still so much growth that can occur just south of us. Um, and we started honing in on the population and the, the, you know, one of the uniqueness of Bailey is uh, the diversity that we have and the, look at the English and, and the, the foreign born population percentage in Harris County and Fort Bend County is some of the highest in the state. Uh, in, two, in Texas, 2009, this, these are the stats from that uh, community survey is just prior to the decennial census, but the state ranking for Texas as far as high school diploma for 25 year old was 79.9 percent. Now, of course, you back up seven years from 25, and this was actually in the early 2000s number for Texas in the nation because that's when they would have graduated. But the bottom line is, is that early in the decade, Texas was trying to make progress. And as you know, you know we're, our graduation rate is one of the highest. But uh, I show you this to say that Texas is, we've got some work to, to do. This is a change in, in projection. This is actual data up through 2010, uh, actually through 2013, uh, through the community survey. And then beyond, all the way up to 2040, the state demographers have, have graphed the, the change in percentage and the breakdown of demographics in, in Texas. And as you can see, the Hispanic population.
just just breaking five hundred thousand and what they're dealing with in Harris County. And then honing down into A League, percentage of population, this is from the census data, percentage of population is five and above who speak language other than English at home and who do not speak English well. In all of region four and thirty plus percent are one of those districts along with all the units. So that's, that's a big picture starting to hone down. Here's Ailey's population over the last 43 years. And this line is a trend line to show you where the rate we were growing. This is just a linear trend line taking it beyond uh, the year that we stopped that rapid <coughs> growth was the year after the Katrina Rita hurricane. So we grew uh, 2,000 in this year for the peak, immediately we lost 2,000. So at our peak, we were at 47,661. Okay? Actual students showing up to school every day. This year, we're at 46,200. So we're still 1,400 less than we were at our peak in the same facilities that we have today. Yes. I just answered my question. I was going to ask you if the boundaries of the district had changed over the years. We opened Homeless Elementary. We were building it at the time when Rita and Katrina came. And we opened it for the 07 08 school year. And so, as I Go through this. Well, I've got some other slides to break down the home. Campus construction, just a, a brief set of facts about that. The last campus we opened was Home Coast Elementary, which is over off of West Park, uh, just west of Highway 6. Uh, the, the seats available at all levels, all grade levels, are more than enough to accommodate the growth that we anticipate. Period. Now, that's what we anticipate. That's based on the data we have today on the growth of residential construction. There's roughly 15 properties of a size big enough in an area that's already not zoned to something else, commercial, that would accommodate an apartment complex. In a we have 218 apartment complexes, equaling over 55,000 apartment units. And is that roughly half of your student population? That is extended? Right at half our okay. population. This year, talking back to the recession, we had an increase in saturation or occupancy of our apartment complexes by three percentage points. Roughly, uh, overall capacities have reached 93 percent. In an apartment complex, that's about what they can handle. Just in the turnover of leasing. There's about 7% that, that's coming in and going out at any given time. So we are pretty full right now. You're right for new construction. With one exception. <coughs> that was at the beginning of the school year. In a three-month period, that's already started to decline. We've okay. lost about 200 students since the beginning of October. Yeah, the, the number you quoted was 46.2, and the graph had 46.3. We... That's an October number. As of today, though, we've dropped yeah, less than about 200. Yeah. And that happens through the year. Typically, October we peak, and then the rest of the year we start a decline. This year we had a little, a little steeper decline after October. And is there a reason why that trend occurs? Have we figured out why, why most of it's in October versus leaving in January? Where you would think that, as a parent, I might let my child stay for the first semester and then leave the This is how your lease falls. You stay in a point, your lease. There is yeah. all, all of the pressure on a parent is to get kids enrolled in school by Labor Day. I mean, that's kind of the mental target that they, we've had for decades. After that, things happen. And like I said, the loyalty to a campus it has, has a little effect if the economics aren't there to stay. And so it doesn't really matter if the lease is expiring or if the job's not there, they have to go. 
Right. It's just, it is what it is. So, yes. It used to be back 30 years ago with migration, or uh, migrant workers, and they were they were coming back from the fields and they were working there or something. That's not the case anymore. No, it's, it's economics. That's mm -hmm. all it is. On the flip side of that is the adjoining district that goes up every year. Actually, Houston has actually been on a kind of a slight decline, I believe. Katie's been on a, on a constant incline, slight very incline before Ben. Um, Spring Branch has declined a little, uh, North Forest. Um, so we've actually seen a couple of years of slight uptick. So, no, what, what I was getting at, is there's an old thing that they just go to Fort Bend every year. That, it's moving around the oh, city. Okay. It, it's, yeah, it's not leaving the city or anything. Yeah. It's, it's in the in the tri county region here. So none of it well, because I, of charter schools or anything else that's causing what that? I what I've noticed is that they're like I said, they're moving from area to area. They may not even be moving out of A Leaf, but they've moved within A Leaf three or four times. There's several kids that I've come in contact with that have almost gone to every elementary school in the district. So it's not that they're leaving the district or that they're getting away. They're simply moving to whatever apartment complex is offering the, the best deal. Two months free, my month, my rent is up, my lease is up here. That's where I'm going. It's pure. I can't tell you how many times over the years, I mean, we can testify to transportation. People call at the beginning of the year and want to get their kid in a bus to a because uh, that's the school that they're going to. And they're they're a few times these people. Or vice versa. They right. say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm calling for principal such and such, and they're calling one of our AD schools, I'm like, that's Houston Heights. That's not AD. Right. So the district level of it, people don't assimilate or, or latch on to as much. So that's why the, the getting the name out constantly saying, we're, we're this district and not that district is important. So um, more of the word AD is associated with every one of our schools that builds that. That level of, of ownership, if you will. But anyway, um, <clears throat> at the elementaries, I include this chart, and I can uh, just briefly, the, the purpose of this is to show all of our elementaries. Today, we had 21,455 students at the elementary level. We have seats to accommodate 26,000. That's including all of our portable buildings. If we, Burned all our portable buildings down. We still have seats for 24,400 at the elementary level. So that's 3,000 more students. That's three big elementary worth of students with empty seats based on the capacity of the buildings. Some is in this building, some is in that building. A lot might be in that school because it's low in the moment, and this school may be over in the moment. So that's when we start looking at hey, can we move some boundary lines here? Trying to level out some of these elementaries. How does 42 portable buildings uh, compare with five years ago? Up or down? About the same. Same. We haven't bought a single portable building. What would you say? I'm sorry. Ten years. We've bought a portable building oh, in ten yeah. years. At least ten years. They're the same building we own. We just moved them right now. At the at the blue. In other words, this is, we haven't bought a single one. They most of them stayed right where they are. You know. Even. Um, but as far as uh, are all 42 be utilized? Not all of them. No. Okay. We have quite a few. Uh, so we have seats at the elementary level. We have uh, 6,000 intermediate students. We have capacity in our intermediate schools for 7,900, 7,400 without portable buildings. Plenty of seats at that level. That's the fifth and sixth grade. At the Middle school level, we have a capacity of uh, 7,600 without portable buildings, 6,500 students at the middle school level. At the high school, we have 12,183 students. We got seats for total all facilities, 14,800. So we have more of them in our facilities. It's boils down to where are they? Are they balanced or are they, uh, is it time to make a boundary change? We haven't made a boundary change since we opened Homequist Elementary, mostly because there wasn't a huge fluctuation.
that year, next year they don't have that deal going. And so their enrollment drops 50 students. And that can happen one year to the next. It's very easy. Most of our elementary. <clears throat> Some of the boundary considerations that we make are at the elementary and intermediate level, we have a bilingual program and a regular program. The bilingual program is where they're taught in Spanish. And that is not offered at ele every elementary. We have it at all the six elementary schools. So depending on where you live, you may be in a different attendance zone to go to this school if you're in a bilingual program versus this school. Uh, another one is our Ames program. At the elementary, we have two schools that service Ames, and that's a math science gifted program. We bus the students to those two elementary schools. Uh, dual language, we're rolling out dual language throughout the district. Making headway, it's going to take a number of years to get that at all the campuses. And then in the in interim, there are certain campuses that are kind of central or satellite campuses or zone to go to for the dual language program. And then, of course, we have special ed programs at various campuses where we have the staff to, to treat different needs. And so those aren't zoned necessarily, and those can change. But those are some of the, uh, the things we think about. But overall, it starts with the housing growth. Growth. Same thing with middle school, housing growth number one. Next is you look at proximity to the school. Most all of our middle schools are exactly the same as far as programs offered, and therefore it comes to distance and that sense of ownership. I always knew that living in this house, I'm going to go to Albright Middle School. Now all of a sudden you're going to tell me I'm not going to Middle School. That, that's not a good thing. I thought I was going to go to Albright. High schools. Housing growth is one consideration, and also that we have early college high school, which is, we've talked about with this group, and our uh, Kerr High School, and that's an application selection process to those two schools, so it's a magnet, if you will, program. But as far as the, the main high schools, the only consideration is housing growth. <coughs> we don't have attendance boundaries, per se, we have the, the draw. Our households, this is brand new data from a company called Metro Study. Uh, just received this two days ago, but basically they are showing the growth or the change in households. And these are homes, single family. And they vary all the way back to 2000. And you can see here between 12 and 13, uh, it's you know, 50, almost 60 homes total. Uh, change in town. So as far as single family homes, the construction literally died at the recession. It was growing up until 2007 and boom, stuck everywhere. And you, you guys know that. I mean, there were subdivisions that were half-built structures, sat there, grew weeds and everything. Finally, in the last couple of years, that picked up and started. Roughly, we got three subdivisions under Construction right now, four if you count uh, Royal Oaks, the states, the number of homes, 19 in Cedar Springs, 14 in Royal Oaks, 13 in Terra del Sol, three in Royal Oaks Estates. Now, Terra del Sol is the biggest for us going into next year. And that is right across the street from Taylor Island. Sorry, Taylor High School. I don't know if you've seen that big area out there. Uh, they're probably halfway built. There's several hundred more flats of homes that can go in there. And they're built with a pretty good clip now. They weren't until just recently at the end of 2013. As far as single family homes, that's it. Apartment complexes under construction today? None. Except we just got a word we've got a tax credit complex and we're trying to build.
hone down now to where we need to make changes for the population changes that have stayed. That we're seeing the, the, the one reason to make a change now to an elementary or to a middle school is to affect a change that's not going to go away next year. I don't want to make a change and then all of a sudden the people move and now we don't have that problem anymore. Now we have a problem in the school we moved them to. We want to pick schools that have consistently risen to a level that's higher than their capacity or right at their capacity. And we've got an elementary close by that we can make a slight change in modification and affect that, that, that elementary. So we're going to make an adjustment this year to Homequist Elementary to relieve some of their crowding that's going to put them just under right at capacity. They're over. Hearn Elementary has been over for a number of years. They're right across the street from O'Donnell Middle School that run across the street from Park Village Apartments, which is a huge uh, number of students come from. Mm -hmm. And that fluctuates every year by 100 students. Uh, we're going to make a change for Horn Elementary, which was the elementary we built just before Homequist, and then one at Ewens, uh, because Ewens is going to be our next dual language school at Ewens, so we need some more room at Ewens. So when we make a change, I'm just picking one of these schools just to kind of give you an idea. A whole district is broken up into little quadrants called cells. There are self-contained little sections of land that all encompass either an apartment complex or more, or a subdivision in an apartment complex or more. But it's boundary by meets and bounds like Texas surveying, so that we can easily say this piece of property, all and all inclusive of everybody who lives there, we move from this school to this school. So here's the change we're going to make with Homequist is uh, so on 19, the monolingual students or the regular program students who are attend Homequist Elementary would move to Hatton Elementary. And this is the boundary of that zone. You know, and it moves from Richmond, west to Long Eldridge, uh, from Eldridge to West Hollow, and that, that's the dis physical description. And then we have a map here where here's Richmond, here's Eldridge, here's West Park, here's West Hollow. And here's all the subdivisions and apartment complexes in here. Savannah Place, Wind Chase Hamlet, West Hall Village, West Hampton Estates, West Wind Town Homes. So the students who are in the regular program that are being bused from that location all the way across Highway 6 to the home place will be moving to Ethel, which is about half the bus ride, half the distance. Now, when we do a change like this, one thing we do right off the bat is tell the parents that if they provide transportation, which we have a very fair number of parents who provide their own transportation uh, for elementaries, then they can continue to take their student to the, the elementary they're currently attending. If, if they're not going to provide transportation, then they would take the bus to the new school. The statistics I've just included is just to show you this one particular move will move 85 students. Uh, so it, it would lower Homeless enrollment by 85 and it would raise Heflin's elementary uh, by 85. So uh, this is just <coughs> one example of the four that we're going to make this year because this will be long lasting. Unless Two years from now, somebody comes in and builds a apartment in place. Right there, there's still a little bit of property between Eflin and Homequist, all the way up to the far west of the district, where there could be some apartment complexes built. Subdivisions won't have much of an effect. Oh, I have a question. So for those ones where you move them from one to the other, are you going to be balancing out the number of kids in those classrooms as well? Because oh, yeah. I gotta yeah. imagine that one teacher may all of a sudden have 25 to 30 students. No, it's always, the, always the staff goes with it. In other words, the staff, the resources are provided. So basically, the bottom line is, is if we're moving 100 students, then the, the elementary they're going to gets their enrollment projections along with those 85 students or those 100 students included at the breakdowns of the grades they're in and they get X number of teachers to make it 22 to 1. Can I add something? So I actually know because my kids go to home class, 
It's about four to five teachers who will be moving with, with those students. Uh, I guess they're figuring out like the grading or what grades are all going to, but um, so no one's out of We will no, no one okay. will lose a job. Okay. It just goes on the last in, first out kind of a life of, okay. of how which teachers go, but but basically every teacher still has a job that they had last year because every we'll, overall we're gonna still grow a little bit next year. So we're gonna need every teacher we have plus a few more. So can I ask a question? Why didn't you make the decision to um, have like have one take everything west of Highway 6 or east of Highway 6 and HomeQuest stay with everything west of Highway 6. Okay. Where did you decide to draw that boundary line? Was there a reason for it? Because we still have some apartment complexes that are east of Highway 6 that are zoned to HomeQuest. Good question. And there's only, there's only a few people in the district that are trying to watch this, and it's the people that live in that area or my office. Right. And so, and have one. There are 81 townhomes being built right behind Heflin right now. They're almost done. They're built overnight. They're platted six years ago, put in streets, uh, fire hydrants and everything, and they're not going to sell them. The company is Carrillo, and they're going to lease them forever. So Heflin's going to get about 50 youngsters out of that, those 80 townhomes, by the next school year. So when you add those to the ones that were taken from Homequist, it's going to put half on right at capacity. Right. So I didn't want to shift this burden to another one. The next shift to fix on was if they continue to grow, which they could, like I said, there's, there's land there for more apartments, okay. would be the shift in the Reese, the Reese So right. we, we have contingencies for future year boundary changes to try and continue to relieve where there's property that can be built, more residences can be built. So, um, it's kind of hard for me to imagine that moving 85 kids makes a real difference. And I think that's because I don't have a lay of a landscape of the school. So how many you know classrooms per grade do you have and how many students over capacity do you add? Okay, so that gets very hard to explain in a setting like this, but I would say it this way. Every grade level is broken down to regular, the elementary broken down to regular program or bilingual program. Okay, so I've got two buckets of students for first grade. Then in some schools, we have a <coughs> language program, which we means that we have another set of classrooms within those first grade that are dual language, so they're being taught English and Spanish at the same time. So there may be actually four buckets of students in that one grade. Every one of those classrooms will is not supposed to be over 22 to 1. So that's the simple math. We do a projection and say however many that breaks down to based on if there's monolingual, <coughs> bilingual, dual language, how many students are they going to be projected at divided by 22, how so many teachers are going to get. Then all the schools are out trying to hire. And we do that early in the spring. So right now I'm going through an enrollment projection. And seeing that trend line that was shooting straight up, now it's level. You know, it's, it's very hard when you break the growth of a half a percent down to 24 elementaries, six grade levels, seven grade levels at most, with pre-K, bilingual and monolingual. When you do all that division, those kids get into the decimals mm -hmm. very quickly. And so there's going to be shifting after. So you'll have a classroom of 24, 25, one over here's got 28, and the first couple of months, hopefully the first month of school, is spent rearranging and getting everybody to 22 and 1. And so it's never a perfect science because I can't tell where everybody's going to move before they move. But when they shake out, the basic math typically works. It's just that the campus level is probably where if we miss it, now we've got issues that we have to move portable buildings. We can't do that overnight with permitting. And then on top of that, that we don't want to spend that kind of money to move a building and permit it and all that. It could be as much as fifteen thousand dollars in the building. And then we learned that we didn't really do that well. So, uh, but we don't want kids sitting in hallways. So when we get close to capacity, we're stressing out the cafeteria, we're stressing out the library, we're stressing out the parking. All those things come to, to a factor. 
there. So what we're trying to do now is take those ones that are over capacity, bring them down within their capacity that they were built for, and then slowly over time see if we get more construction than we do, and we've got a plan to build more facility space. But right now we don't think we're going to have a need to build more typical standard classroom space. We can live with what we have. It's just that people might have to change schools a little bit more balance. So if you're down to decimals, then where does the point six kid go? To Homequist or to Heffel? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we round up. Or do you flip a coin? Yeah. And the school that the school that's at capacity gets the benefit of the doubt. Okay. That's that's always the case because um, we've got. Um, Say probably six elementaries that are have been living at over capacity conditions. And well you ask me one of them. It's moving from a good school to a good school. They don't want to go. But, I mean, once a family gets embedded in one of our schools, okay. it's not like this, I'm going from the bad school to the good school. That's not the case. So none of these are going to be popular. And they and everybody's dealt with what they have. So maybe but it looks like lunch running from 10 o'clock until 1 o'clock and then, you know, to get all the kids fed. And so those kind of things, we're trying to relieve that right. kind of stress. So it's building right. with staff. And, yeah. But it looks like you've got, got a degree of grandfathering, though, with the self-commute. Yeah, and we have, in some schools, we have as much as half the school that's walking or car rider situation. And the car riders population is pretty high. I mean, you can see them the streets lined up at this missile time. Mm -hmm. We've got as good as any neighboring district as far as uh, ownership of, of picking up the kids is by car. And that that's a good thing if you want that. But at the same time, when the school's <clears throat> over capacity, then the neighborhoods around are having to deal with that congestion. So and we've got some neighborhoods that have been dealing with it for a while. So we're so as an example, on Homequist now, when is their first lunch period? In the 10 o'clock hour somewhere? It's like 10, 10, 10, 10.50. Okay. So when this change happens, what's the first lunch hour going to be? It might not be a change. It might not be enough to change the okay. lunch hour. It's just the number being fed at that The time. capacity? Okay. Yeah. Which makes every meal served faster if it's cafeteria is not as full, so the less staff have to be on duty. Probably oh, because more time to eat their food, which will be next. You know, when I had your question about 85 times raw numbers, does it sound like a okay. game changer? In raw numbers, it doesn't sound like a game changer. But when you, when you look at exponentially how that each one of those 85, they really do take the place. They're, they're a student in the classroom. They're also a student in the cafeteria. They're a student at recess. They're a student in the library. And that's what makes that 80. When you take that 85 off of the campus, it's already 100 or so over capacity. It does make a difference. I mean, it does it to the, to the, entire, to the, to the entire environment. The other thing I'll tell you about boundaries, to your question, yeah, are we People may look logically and say, well, just put them, they're on this side of this highway, put them over here. They're on this side of this highway, they go over here. And every once in a while, that does work out. But I have found in my experiences that very rarely does it, does it work out just because of the logistics of where the, the growth is going to be. The other thing, Charles alluded to this, um, when you do boundaries, you have to be thinking three to five years in advance, mm -hmm. trying to forecast what might happen, or what might happen, or what might not happen. And, uh, you know, six being such a major thoroughfare makes sense, but because of what we know at that point and what's going on at that point. Right. I didn't know that about Hef one, but I know about the three or four properties that are available around Home Club. So that's why I was wondering why they didn't just go ahead and give a little bit more relief. Because right. so, uh, yeah. we know we have relief. If that were to come past, we know that we've got some relief. We've got some The one who had it before me was Charlie Hoff. I don't know if you knew him, but he was, he'd been principal for years. Spent his whole career here. This man over here is the same way. He knows a lot about property, what the changes it's gone through. And so that institutional knowledge as time changes, you know, that helps forecast. Well, you know, the 
trying to open up their, trying to build their once before, and this is the reason why they ended up not doing it. You know, so you can say, okay, I bet that's not going to end up being one. Yeah. And sure enough, there's a super target shows up there in right, the corner right. of Elvish and West Island. You know? yeah. So there's, plus the district owns a number of property, pieces of the district. And, and so when you look at the vacant land, some of it's available for building, most of it's not. Most right. of it is being held at a very high price, yeah. and they know what they have. Right. So uh, we've had some very nice high-end apartment complexes built in the West Chase area, uh, and I would just imagine we're still, still going to see some of that kind of growth along the Beltway. I don't know that we're going to see much of that along Highway 6. Right, well, they built up uh, West of Small, for instance. They're trying to bring the rent revamp it, right? Um, and then you guys are going to be doing the amphitheater at McClendon Park. Well, you have the land uh, across the street. There's that Mission Ben Christian Academy, uh, and they're selling the land that's over there uh, on the other side of McClendon Park. And then right next to McClendon Park, there's a, a, a lot. They could be commercial, actually, but I think it'll probably be like a small apartment complex. One day is what I... I mean, I don't want it to be an apartment complex, but that's what I think that it's going to end up being. I mean, we, I don't know. We know, we know of, in other words, we get tidbits of information from different groups, and and one of those being that we continually have the second highest bond rating that you can get, and part of that is is tied really tightly with the West Chase district and the kind of business that it generates and the kind of people that. Uh, companies and investors that look at that property and that's churning <coughs> like it hasn't been in a long time so it could be some growth. This is Sam Hill at one time they were trying to put some subsidized housing behind an Uncle Bob storage. Uh, yeah, that's so what I was talking about. Off of uh, Island 6. So we thought that one. That, yeah. We thought that one. Well, we got another one that's going to try and open up next to Alexander. We got a letter to the letter today. <laughs> I know he was indicated that the subdivision across from Taylor had a 100 and some homes coming up. Well, I spoke to the builder because I was interested in doing some land over there, and they indicated that they were having 500 homes coming up. Is that you sure, so the land? Sure, yes. so At build out. At build out, so be over 500 homes. Yeah, they're, they're partly built.
condemned and being demoed. They're gone. Is that continuing to happen? They're gone. There's there's being there's a few more that are being looked at, but they're not at that level. Um, Did the city get some bonding so that they could do demolition? They had, they had to use bond money to pay for that. Correct. Uh, uh, councilman helped us with that in my last year. Last year. Last year. Okay. Yeah. And that that was one of a number that could happen. Now, in that case, boy, he's living there. Right. Right. Uh, those were right. But, but, but there's redevelopment possibility. Yeah. 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 There's, there's, there's an investor that we're aware of that are looking very close. Okay. But that's, that's the I'm kind of project that we, that we need. Um, there's one down off in the Horn area in that general neighborhood that this and that and east of the Beltway that has 400 plus units that were built back in the early 70s, 72, somewhere in there. Um, <coughs> Premier of Wood Fair, when they're come in close half the complex, went through a tax credit renovation project that's a home fund from the county, some from the city, went through that. They're, when they reopen, full capacity. I mean, it's just, and that's, that's, our students, our, our kids, and our families would be right in there, and it's like a like new situation right there where they were living. So um, that kind of thing helps. And, and if it's too far gone, then now we've had some consortium groups that got together and renovated on their own and bought a property. There's some property changes in, so we may see some of that just out of private funds. And that may continue, because that still can be profitable. Because there's enough people that, that want to have it. One thing we have to keep in mind is offering an education that people want, whether they're relocating or whether they're choosing to stay here. And that's the one thing that this district experienced 30, 20, 30 years ago is when you're in a suburb area and you have dirt to develop and people are building new neighborhoods and new homes, and that's where a lot of people will, will move if you can always pull out into. And that's what you're seeing in Fort Lee and South Fairbanks and Gay. They have dirt, they develop a neighborhood, people choose to move to that area. So, you know, boundaries are, <laughs> and Nina knows this as a board member, boundaries are one of those things I would stay away from. Is, if I could go my entire career without having to redo boundaries, I would do it. It is one of the most emotional uh, issues that you have to deal with with, with moving kids and parents. In a previous life, I was over the apartment that did boundaries, and we, we changed boundaries every year, every year. And in some cases, we would have, because of growth, we would have kids who went to between kindergarten, fifth grade, they went to three different elementary schools, never changed how much. Mm -hmm. And it was because of the growth. I've, I've, I've been down this road before, and we, we, we didn't think this was really important and necessary for the, the schools that were really hurting who would be doing this. So anyway, we just want to give you an idea of what we're talking to the board about and the board of these things. We have to decide where we're going to be sure about whether they approve of the recommendations we're going to make. All of this is information we share with them. Uh, we want you to kind of know from a bigger self help view perspective about what the enrollment trends are like, the patterns are like, and what, what drives the district to do. I'll assure you, once this gets out, there'll be parents who are not upset. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Somebody said, just So, so it's a board decision based on staff recommendation 
that may happen this next yeah. school year? It's a it's, okay. It's a board thing. In other words, it's it, well, they're the elected guys. It's one of their duties. It's one of their duties. Their realms. Yeah. But yes, they rely on us to generate the numbers and bring back, and then we take it to the parents, and I bring back the feedback uh, to the board for a final adoption. And we can back off of this. Sure. And say, no, we're not going to do it. You know, if it was really bad, 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 you know, then we wouldn't do it. So that's, that's part of the process. You, you start well in advance. You ask the board, hey, do you approve us even looking into this? If they don't have the stomach for it, don't have the type for it, don't want to mess with it, they tell us no, we don't do it. In this case, they say yes, and we spend 12 months doing exactly what he's doing. Well, we, in this district, we have a real, I think, a real efficient use of space. So we stop building when we need to stop building. Built beyond what they needed. You know, well, your numbers show peak, you know, six, seven years ago, and that's when your last building was. I, I know, we went back to raw numbers, I know that when he showed capacity versus butts and seats, you, know, you see a 3,000 delta, 3,000 student delta at the elementary level. That sounds like a lot. For 24 kids, that's not a lot. Yeah, that is not a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you compare that to other districts who sometimes get a little over and a little over ambitious and build schools when they really could have just built in the part of a rebound, a rezoning. I mean, we had a neighbor in the southwest of us that had a couple of high schools that quite frankly they didn't do something about it they're less than half the best. And that's what happens. After. But, uh, we have some room to grow. I don't think we'll ever have to build another school to grow unless something really crazy happens somewhere. Anyway, that, this is one of the issues that, 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 that uh, calls for all kinds of issues, and our job is to communicate as best we can and explain to families what we're doing. And I think the dramatic story we have to tell is that your child is being moved to another school and not being moved to a lesser quality school. The schools are being affected right now. The meeting, I think, is on the 21st, if you are interested in, like, going to one of those. I mean, not you, but just in general. Uh, I'm, I'm not planning to move, but I did get the letter last week, I think, sometimes. Uh, and I thought it was really good um, to see them get some relief, because they've been over capacity for a while. And every year, a home class gets more and more students. And it's just been like the hot spot to move over into that area. So I'm actually looking forward to getting to seeing the school have some money. So I think it's good that you guys made that decision. Earn the same way earn is today. Anything else? We'll go to the we'll, uh, uh, Craig will send out that information to you. So if you have any added comments or suggestions on what, what she's trying to tackle on that community engagement piece. Worthy. Yeah, bus worthy. Open the windows. I don't know. I might get you one of those ones. No, we are, we're going to kind of organize that and do it during the day and kind of take you guys to where we'll just like take you to an example of what's going on with the elementary and the middle of high school and wrap it up with lunch. So we can just that last year. We'll do the same thing. All right? On Friday. On Friday would be great.